Hey y'all, here are OS Reviews. In this video, we're taking a closer look at the Google Pixel tablet, now almost one year later. So this is a very interesting device because for a long time, it seemed like tablets, especially running on Android, were on their way out. Google even said back in 2019 that they had no plans to create another tablet, leaving products like the Pixel C tablet as well as the Nexus tablets kind of a memory of the past. Which is why it was surprising and met with some degree of excitement when the Pixel tablet did first hit the shelves, bringing some much needed competition into this space and signaling perhaps a larger emphasis on Google's part to provide more tablet optimized software experiences going forward. That being said, over the last couple of months, it seems like interest in the Pixel tablet has somehow fallen off a little bit. It's dwindled. So I thought it'd be a good time to kind of revisit this, especially since Google recently made the tablet available without the speaker dock that it came originally bundled with for $4.99. And now you can find just the tablet itself, similar to an iPad, for $3.99. But keep in mind that one of the interesting perks, at least if you're living in certain markets like the US and Canada, is Google's store often has very aggressive sales and that means if you frequently shop around, you can often trade in something like an older gen iPad and get one of the Pixel tablets almost for free, as well as other Samsung Galaxy tablets too, if you want to try a more clean vanilla experience that Google offers. So again, depending on the market that you're living in and when those offers are around, it could become a lot more attractive from a value perspective. Pixel tablet takes large inspiration from the Nest Hub smart displays that came before it, from the bezel to the speaker dock that of course on this unit can be fully detached, but when you pop it into place, it can be used for charging, providing a better audio experience compared to the built-in speakers of the tablet, which are smaller, in addition to having the device pretty much always charged, and you can just pop it off magnetically when you want to use it. So it's a pretty clever approach and makes it also a hybrid home assistant device slash smart speaker in addition to only a tablet. That being said, there are a couple of caveats here. For one, when you're in this docked smart display mode, it doesn't actually have all of the functionality that a true Nest Hub offers. For instance, you actually can't use the Pixel tablet to act as a viewfinder for looking at smart security camera footage the same way that the Nest Hubs have, which was a little bit strange and that still remains true to date. In addition, there are no motion sensors such as the Soli radar sensor built in that allowed you on the Nest Hub smart displays to track sleep, for example, although core functionality such as controlling home appliances, using your voice to access the assistant, as well as taking a look at a home dashboard can still be found in the docked mode, in addition to acting as kind of a smart digital photo frame, integrating with Google Photos can still be found here. Just like the Nest Hub though, the display is set at this one angle. There's no way to tilt it further up or down, which might have been more convenient if you're using it for media consumption purposes. The hardware specs of the Pixel tablet, it's obviously going to be much faster and more performant compared to the Nest Hub smart displays, which have something like a quad-core processor. This instead has a Tensor G2, the same chipset found on Google's Pixel 7 series of smartphones. Of course, that's a little bit behind versus the current gen Pixel 8, but you still get a very similar level of performance. It's a custom made silicone that is optimized for AI related tasks. And through subsequent software updates, Google have finally brought some of those features over. Uh, for example, you can long hold on the home section now to circle to search on different regions, as well as translate the entire page that you're looking at, as well as perform image search more quickly. And one other feature unique to the Pixel tablet and not on on these smart displays is support for USI stylus pens. You can find a variety of manufacturers creating them. For example, this one from Penovo works quite well using the USI 2.0 standard. That's a protocol also found on many Chromebooks, and it has support for over 4,000 levels of pressure sensitivity that you can use for note-taking purposes. We'll talk a little bit more about that experience later on. The Pixel tablet, of course, does have a rear-facing camera for document scanning purposes. It's 8 megapixels, quite basic, but gets the job done, as well as a front-facing webcam for video conferencing purposes. The body is constructed out of 100% recycled aluminum that's been coated with a layer of ceramic to make it less cold as you're picking it up. And again, a similar treatment, in fact, to something like a Pixel 5 from a few years back. It actually feels quite good. You will find just the docking pins on the rear. Although, again, this is the only accessory that Google have released to date. So it would have been nice if they offered other modular accessories, like a keyboard case, for example, but we'll have to see maybe in a next generation model. 
What I do like, though, is on the very bottom, there are some silicone soft touch feet that prevents the tablet from getting scratched or moving around onto a surface or desk if you are setting it flat against a wall, for instance, although there is no built-in kickstand aside from the speaker dock uh, that you have there. Now, there are quad speakers built into the tablet, so there are two on the left as well as two on the right. So even though the speaker dock will, of course, improve on the bass, especially lower frequency notes, however, the actual sound quality here is already better than you'll find on a smartphone in terms of volume output and it's pretty good to be honest for just watching back YouTube videos and Netflix with. A demo will be shown later on as well and there's also a Type-C port on the edge there for charging. 7,000 mAh capacity battery tops up at 15 watts. So just like on their smartphones this is far from the fastest charging speeds. In fact it gets from 0 to 100% in around 2 hours and 40 minutes. That's bearable, especially since when you have a detached, the large capacity here can get you around 12 hours of media consumption and web browsing before it runs completely flat. Then you can pop it up on here overnight and it gets charged up to something like 90% to prevent the battery life from degrading quite as quickly. Uh, that being said, again, Samsung's tablets typically have faster charging wattage, similar to on their phones, and you can top it up in something like just an hour or so. So by contrast, you have to just wait a little bit longer on here. Now the screen here measures nearly 11 inches diagonally. It is a IPS LCD panel that offers decent brightness and very good color accuracy, similar to the Nest Smart Display Hubs, there are proximity light sensor up top that will also know the ambient surrounding that you're in and change the color temperature of the display dynamically to coordinate with your indoor conditions, getting a little bit warmer, for example, if you have a more yellowish tint in the room, that actually looks quite decent. However, it is a glossy panel, and that means, again, if you are using it with a stylus or in more direct sunlight, you will have a fair bit of reflections and glare, so maybe a matte screen protector could be recommended. Maybe the biggest omission here is it's using a standard 60 hertz refresh rate as compared to something faster like 90 or 120 that we are beginning to see even on their smartphones. So that's another area where hopefully we'll see more improvements on maybe in a next generation model. Synthetic benchmarks are comparable to something like a Snapdragon 888 from a couple years back, but that still is more than good enough for web browsing as well as some casual gaming here and there, in addition to some of those AI tasks that the chip is really optimized to do well in. I'll also mention that the tablet does have some magnetic areas in the rear that you can use to hold a metal stylus into place. Located on the very top edge, by the way, is also going to be a volume rocker in addition to a power key slash integrated fingerprint scanner that has been pretty accurate in my testing. There's also dual microphones up top for, again, using it in the smart speaker assistant mode, picks up your voice really without too many issues. And before we dive in deeper, here's also a quick size comparison. Let's start with something like, for example, Google Pixel 6. And here's the Amazon Fire Max 11, which is kind of Amazon's response, I believe, to the Pixel tablet because it's also their most premium tablet to date. It has a 11-inch panel, again, very similar size to the Pixel tablet, also crafted out of metal, also with a fingerprint scanner, and with the uh, Alexa Assistant built in instead of, of course, Google Assistant. That being said, it is just a matter of different ecosystems. And also the Fire Max 11 has an optional keyboard dock, but there is no speaker dock equivalent there. Another size comparison with the Pixelbook from a couple of years back. It was kind of their flagship Chromebook at the time that also has a touchscreen convertible form factor. And of course, it's going to be a larger device with thicker bezels. It's a 12.5 inch screen, but you get the idea. And again, continues Google's legacy, I guess, of producing very clean, subdued, minimalistic products. Just for reference, here is a Samsung Galaxy Tab S6 slash S6 Lite, which has a 10.5 inch panel instead of 11 inches, so a touch more narrow on the edge, but overall very similar uh, when it comes to dimensions. And both are gonna give you a pretty nice boost as compared to a phone, of course, when it comes to media and entertainment, but still more compact compared to a true laptop, that is. So taking a closer look at the software experience next, again, one of the specialties of this particular model is that docking function. So if you pop it into this dock, it will automatically go into the kind of smart display mode. You can customize it to show your Google Photos, different animated artwork, as well as trigger the 
smart home control dashboard on the edge, so controlling other lights that you may have, as well as robot vacuum cleaners, in addition to using your voice to ask questions more freely and charging the device at the same time. You can also supposedly activate a quick Google Keep note here on the side, but this is an area where I think there are still a couple of quirks or bugs that Google has to iron out. It just tells us to update Google Keep to continue. However, if we tap on update, we can see that it's already the most up-to-date version of the software. I've tried uninstalling and reinstalling, and it doesn't really seem to change that situation. Even though the Google Keeps app is still fully functional, whenever we tap on a new note, once unlocked, we're still able to write. But on this main uh, homepage here, this particular shortcut still seems to be a little glitchy, at least on my unit, but it is what it is. Otherwise, when we get into the regular Android experience, it's actually quite fluid and Again, super clean since it's made by Google. You can expect no bloatware on here at all, aside from just the standard Google apps and services. And through subsequent software updates, I would say the stylus integration situation in Android 14 has also slightly improved. So now similar to on the Fire Max 11, as well as on Samsung's One UI on their Galaxy tablets, you can write directly on text boxes in order to search things up. So for example, hello, and you can write pretty easily with handwriting transcription doing its job. So there are some gradual improvements here and there. And again, circle to search does work quite well using the precision of a stylus pen that you can just tap along there. And there are some hover capabilities as well with USI 2.0. So if you slowly move over certain apps and different folders, you can tell how it just enlarges without actually touching on the display. In device settings, you can also take a look at the battery percentage remaining in your USI pen. And again, any USI 2.0 protocol pen will be fully functional here, similar to on their Chromebooks. So here's one from Lenovo, for example, versus one from HP, and they will all work, giving you some variety of options that you can pick between. That being said, some other software improvements I would like to see added from Google's part would be the ability for you to take screenshots uh, just using the stylus to clip a specific region of the page, as well as maybe annotate over it, similar to what Samsung and even Motorola have on their stylus-equipped devices. Otherwise, the tablet comes with standard connectivity, including Wi-Fi, GPS, as well as Bluetooth, although there is no cellular model at this point in time. And in terms of storage capacity, there are both 128 and 256 gigabyte capacity versions. There are no expandable storage options on the tablet, unfortunately. You really would have liked to see a micro SD card slot. So again, you are stuck with the amount that you get by default out of the box. Now, when it comes to the performance, again, fairly fluid and fast, although one initial concern I had was with the thermals, because as some of you guys may know, with the Pixel 6, 7, and 8, the Tensor chips aren't known to be the most thermally efficient in the world. But luckily on the Pixel tablet, it seems like it's not quite as big of a concern. And I think it's partially because there is just a larger surface area for the heat to dissipate uh, with the metal build on the back as well. It does get a little bit warmer towards the top region here, uh, this section on the rear, but because that's actually not touching the docked speaker down below, and also when you're holding it, it actually still remains cool in this entire bottom section. So not as noticeable as on a Pixel phone. And in general, I didn't find it to be problematic, again, from a performance point of view, luckily. And just doing a quick example of that, if we try jumping into the browser, uh, you can tell that loading up pages is really not going to fare poorly on this tablet at all, which is not too surprising because it's using essentially a prior gen flagship CPU inside. And again, when compared to something like a Amazon Fire Max 11, you can expect a higher degree of performance here underneath the hood. So any web page that you're trying to load back with lots of videos and ads will still snap into view fairly quickly. I was able to juggle around a dozen tabs and still jump back and forth between them pretty smoothly as well using the eight gigabytes of built-in RAM, which I think is pretty sufficient from a tablet performance point of view. And all the elements in terms of multitasking also feel quite smooth and fast. And we can also find a split screen option on the side if you're trying to do something like take notes while watching a video and it can run side-by-side -side apps actually pretty quickly and fluidly using the processing package inside. So not too problematic as you can tell there find more and more of these split columns that take advantage of a larger screen compared to past generations of Android OS that really just stretched the entire image across a larger panel and didn't feel as optimized as the iPad OS counterpart. But that is slowly changing, thankfully, on Android 14 and newer devices. And now moving into a quick demo of video consumption as well as what the speaker sounds like, beginning with the docked hub mode here first.
And now undocking. All right, so turning the volume down there, takeaways being that there's a pretty big difference in the depth of the sound, especially again with bass. Uh, when you have it docked, there's just much larger drivers inside. It makes the tablet speakers actually sound a little tinny by contrast, even though in a vacuum, the Pixel tablet speakers are already above average, I would say, when it comes to clarity. There's just not as much, again, depth as the speaker dock. Again, there is no 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, unfortunately, on this tablet, which I do hope more manufacturers can bring back just to provide you with another option, even though wireless headphones and speakers are here to stay. As for other attributes, including the camera performance, it's nothing to write home about, especially for a Pixel branded device, since their phones have excellent photography capabilities, especially with the processing point of view. On here, it certainly is above average for a tablet, but it's not quite as good as their phones, just because the hardware sensor is a little bit weaker in terms of resolution, but it's still more than good enough when it comes to capturing text details clearly and scanning things in. You can also find plenty of the Pixel classics, such as Night Sight, for lower light capture, and similarly, the front-facing webcam works well enough for video conferencing purposes. Now let's also move into the stylus performance next, and here's also an area where I think Google has a little bit more work to do with their own Google Keep app. I mentioned earlier that the lock screen quick launch shortcut is a little bit glitchy. Aside from that, the actual application itself, I think, also needs some updates in the context of not really supporting pressure sensitivity for some reason. So on here, if I go really fast, you'll see a larger line versus if I go really slow, it's just a smaller line, but it's just based on speed as opposed to how hard I'm pressing on the screen, even though the stylus supports pressure sensitivity as we saw there from earlier and also hover capability as well. So what that means is if you want the best inking experience, you have to install a third-party application, for example, Squid, which is also found on Chrome OS Chromebooks, in addition to Wacom's Bamboo Paper. I have to say, great job on Wacom's part as well, because my understanding is Bamboo Paper, this application back in the day actually didn't support pressure sensitivity, but over subsequent software updates, Wacom have added it in, and now it's actually a pretty good alternative to Squid, so as you are using it for kind of jotting things down, again, I can press harder to have a harder line versus more lightly, and you can see that difference in pressure. There's also a very minimal latency or lag as you're using this particular application, similar to the Squid app as well, as compared to when you're using the Google Keeps app, there actually is a little bit more latency going on. Uh, so here's another comparison with Keep. Just by opening this up, you can tell how, as I'm going very quickly, it might actually lag behind a little bit more. But that's primarily from a software point of view, because as we can tell here, using just a different app, even if we're sliding along really quickly, it's able to keep up with the stylus point actually really without any issues. So it's all down to software optimization at the end of the day. Palm rejection also seems to work well enough. So if I'm putting my, again, hand down on here, I can still be able to write without any interference, as you can tell. So it's a pretty solid experience just for jotting things down. Now, when it comes to drawing, this is an area where you're also able to try out applications, including Krita, as well as Sketchbook and Artflow. These three all tend to work quite well, but I would say Artflow is maybe the most welcoming for novice artists out there that are just trying to draw. Again, the latency is really not bad at all for just a 60 hertz refresh rate display, as you can tell there, keeping up with the pen tip. But if you want a little bit more granular controls, you can try something like Krita, which is also an application that is more similar to what you'll find on, let's say, a Mac or Windows PC. So you have that hover capability, that mouse point that appears. Some of the icons though are definitely a little bit smaller. Uh, however, it still is easy enough to use. You have plenty of brush styles. And if you're trying to get into digital art, it's surprisingly not a bad experience. And Sketchbook, I would say, is right in the middle of those two applications when it comes to ease of use, but still giving you plenty of options that you can play around with. So all in all, definitely not bad. Perhaps you get slightly lower latency with a Apple 
Pencil, especially the Pencil Pro, but there's obviously a much higher price that you have to pay for that experience. And if you're just a casual note taker for students, as well as maybe for business purposes, I think you'll still be mostly content. Last but not least, when it comes to some gaming performance, it's definitely more than serviceable, even on slightly more demanding games, such as Sky here, as well as PUBG, Asphalt Series even on higher graphic settings, it remains relatively comfortable as you're holding onto the sides here, and again, remains a pretty fluid experience, all things considered. Especially with a larger battery, again, you can use this thing continuously for just more hours as well. Again, there's nothing from the store that you aren't able to play or install, including social media applications, again, any games utility tools that you'll find, it can be uh, more than usable enough. However, it's not all sunshine and rainbow. There are two caveats, one of them being the USB Type-C port does not provide video output, which seems to be a reoccurring weakness on Pixel hardware to date. So there is no, for example, desktop mode if you're connecting it to a monitor, unfortunately, which means if you're going after true productivity, a Chromebook, as well as Chrome OS in general, might still have a slight upper hand, especially since many Chromebooks, newer models these days, can also run Android apps. That being said, the fluidity of the UI may not be quite as responsive as true Android, and you definitely won't find a Chromebook that also serves double duty as a smart display, but chances are you will get a better keyboard as well as trackpad experience when you're using it more in a conventional laptop desktop form factor. But overall, this suits the purpose of entertainment and again, home automation quite well. One feature that you do have retained from the larger Google Nest Hub displays is Chromecast built on in. You can use this essentially as a small portable wireless monitor when docked inside of the base over here. So on any Chrome browser enabled device, including desktop computers as well as phones, you just have to select the corresponding Pixel tablet and you'll be able to again mirror the screen you have on your desktop as well as extend the screen using it as a small portable monitor. You don't have touch functionality working in the Chromecast mode, but it is being treated essentially as a small smart display in this particular format, which I think is actually quite clever and works quite well. If you want to share kind of a photo, a document quickly onto this in the kitchen, for example, especially on a larger 11-inch screen compared to the smaller 7-inch Nest Hub, it is nice to have this Chromecast capability that is also missing from the majority of other Android tablets on the market. So this happens to be a really trippy example because we're running Chrome OS now on an Android tablet, as you can tell there, really just mirroring the screen. But you can do the same thing with a Windows or a Mac device as well. So there we have it. That's a closer look at the Google Pixel tablet kind of one year later, a longer term reflection of some of the updates as well as areas that have further room for improvement. But as a whole, I would say this is still a very solid tablet to consider, especially again, if you are in certain markets with illegible trade-in offers, always be on the lookout for it. It can be much more affordable than the MRSP may imply. The integration with the speaker dock, I think is also quite clever, at least the concept, uh, being able to use it as a smart photo frame, aka a Nest Hub, a larger version of that when it's docked, and there's nothing holding you back from getting a third-party Bluetooth keyboard case as well. Uh, so even though there are still a few quirks that I think can be ironed out, again hopefully in a next-gen model, I would say that's still a very compelling option, especially in the Android landscape, and it's really good to see some form of tablet still made and manufactured by Google at the end of the day, keeping this form factor alive uh, with more developments and updates to come. In some ways, in fact, I would argue it's a bit of an underrated tablet uh, here in 2024 when it comes to the value as well as still pretty good performance and different ways that you're able to use this thing. You can check out more details if you are interested and in links down below. But for now, that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That's been the Pixel Tablet Revisited.